or yeah, chapters. So we are going to basically take, uh, discuss about writing functions, documenting, and a bit of a namespace. So, all right, so the basic idea in all this, um, for all these three chapters is how we can, um, after writing a function, and then we can use the Roxygen um, uh, package to, to also include all the details about the function that we are writing. And by using this Roxygen package, then it will automatically create a, a documentation when we are uh, building the package. So this is, will be uh, discussed in the chapter seven, and this is for in the chapter 10. So for the chapter 10, we're going to discuss how we can uh, write a documentation of a function or even a family of functions. So how we can make the, the .rd file uh, for like, like for one function, we have one .rd file or for a family of functions that may um, act the same or in the family of, of um, a certain operations, how can we group them in one document um, documentation file? And in chapter 13, we're discussing on how to um, import the package and also export the functions. And the, uh, the basic idea of uh, chapter 13 is to smartly import and export functions to minimize changes in the global environment. All right. So when we are writing our code, of course, uh, we will put the .r file in the R directory. And the uh, best standard is to um, do load all, test, and then check. Well, for me, I Personally, I would always um, do the check first. And if the check fails, then I would um, attend to it before loading any of the functions. But that's just how I did it in, the, uh, in building a package. I haven't really used the test because I have not an inkling of idea um, how to build a good test, but I think we're going to discuss that in the uh, next or maybe in the second session after this. So we'll go in details about testing later on. All right, so um, it, within a single .r file, we can, um, we can include only one function for a single .r file but then if we use only one, fu uh, one function for an R script, then in our R folder, we will have so many um, files in no time. So it is a good idea to include related functions or a family of functions into a single um, .r file. But if um, you have one function that cannot really match with other function that you have in your package, then you can just put it in a separate R script. I usually have, almost always have a utils.r file where it's just basically um, like my uh, trash bin of all the functions that I think I will use, but I'm not entirely sure where it belongs. I'll just put it there. Yes. And after we have all the, uh, the functions, of course, we can make them available in, uh, for interactive use by using the DevTools load all function. So this is um, um, so when we are writing a function, it is very recommended to follow a certain um, style guide. There are a lot of style guides, and for tidyverse, they they are endorsing this one particular tidy first style guide. And this process can be automated using the styler package. 
And if you install this package and you're using Art Studio, then it also there's also a Art Studio add-in where you can simply highlight um, your code. And I think the default shortcut is Control Shift A or something, and it can immediately um, tidy up your code according to the style guide. But whatever style guide you use, I think um, just use whatever that is consistent. I don't think that it is like a single best and the most correct style guide um, ever. All right. And I think we have discussed this um, in the previous sessions. So when we're writing um, a function in a package, if you are creating an object using a function, for example, we are recording the time and we want to put it to, to store it in an object. If we have it outside of, fun outside of function, but within a the package, then the system time will be the system time when the package binary was built. But of course, it's different when we're um, doing it in uh, interactively, then the system time will always be um, the system time when we um, when we enter this in the console. And so, but if you want to do this in a package, then we can solve that problem by putting the code into the functions. I have a different example here. For example, we want to save a CSV file, but then we want to uh, directly concatenate uh, um, the date, the, cur the current date into the file name. And here, so if I do with this first way, then um, what I have, and then the date will always be the date when the package binary was built. Of course, that's not what we want to do. So we do this instead. So we put this inside a function and then the system date will be called or executed or run uh, whenever we are using this function. And of course, that's what we want to do. We want to um, embed the date using the current date when we are running that function. Okay, oops. Okay. Hmm. All right. And when and if we want to ally alias a function, it is highly it is well we can do this. So a package and then uh two columns and then the name of the function. But then if we do this, then the um, version of this uh, function will refer to the version of this package um, on the machine where the binary package is built. So of course, when we are um, installing this package uh, somewhere else, then you would, maybe you would have a different function, different version of this package then this will mess things up. So it is highly recommended to do this instead if you want to ally us um, a function. Okay. So there are several uh, functions in R that we have to be very, very careful to include in a package. And these are the four most, um, I would say, dangerous uh, functions um, that you should avoid when you're writing a package. We will discuss about this in the third section on namespace. And there's also about the options, um, set working directory and source. And you can imagine, for example, if we do this uh, set working directory, then there may be a confusion. Okay, is the working is this the working directory um, in the platform where the binary package was built, or the working directory of 
the current user. So, yeah, I think I'm not entirely sure about the entire um, use case or horror story surrounding all these four functions, but I think it's just a good idea to stay away from um, these four functions when we are writing a package. So, and if you want to alter the options, for example, on how many significant digits you want to display, then it is highly recommended to use with R. So if we don't use it, and this is basically uh, just rounding um, your kind, kind of like rounding your digit into the significant digits, if we set an option within this function, then this will persist. So for example, here, we want to just, uh, we are this printing the pi, then we get um, this one to um, six significant digits. And we, when we run this, then we'll have two. And afterwards, if we run, if we print the pi again, then we still have um, the same output as this one, whereas this is not what we intended. We intended to only apply these options whenever we are running this function. But if we do this, then this change in option will persist. And to mitigate this, we can use the with our package instead. So there is also a, a base R solution to this, but I find this much simpler. But then of course, if you're using um, this one package, then it means you're adding an extra dependency um, into your package. So I think just to keep in mind that there is also an equivalent way to do this in base R, but if you want, well, for me, it well, it's not that difficult actually, but I think it's just very neat. So for the with R, I think, yeah, there are two variants of the functions that are included in the with R package. So either those with the local prefix or with the with prefix. And what's the difference? So here I have two functions, neat and neater. And so here I'm using with R um, for the with options. And if I do this, then what it does is actually I will print this um, maybe affect this um, no, numeric variable X using these options. So this is kind of like kind of the same uh, when you're using the base with um, function where you, for example, you use with um, data frame and then you want to plot so that you don't have to type the a name of the data frame again and again. So it's, I, um, I think of this as like temporarily attaching this options into what you want to do. So I find that, I think the use case for this, so if you have um, lots of code here and then in the middle, uh, maybe you want to print an intermediate product, then you can just uh, use this. And then um, in the next um, chunk of codes, it will not consider these options anymore. So it will uh, resume So as we see here. And another option is using the, look, uh, the local options. So this, um, this will apply this option into all the outputs that are printed within the function until this function exits. So I think this will be very useful if you have a lot of um, uh, printing, for example, and you just have to declare it once and it will apply this modification into all 
your function calls. All right. Um, so far, is there any questions or ideas? Yeah, no, I, actually, this, the, the WIFAR stuff, is, uh, I use it a lot. I, 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 when I found it in the book, it, uh, it, it was a real improvement in my code. <laughs> Because uh, especially if you are trying to use, because actually if you are creating code, code from the, the beginning, you, you can already prepare your code for it to don't depend on, on options or environment, environment uh, var variables. But if you are using another package that already depends on options, we far is really helpful. It's, it's, uh, I think it's where it's mostly help, helpful. Mm. <laughs> And what are the options that you usually use? Um... Yeah, for, for example, I was trying to create a function around uh, use this. They use this, uh, they, for example, they use this create package function. It uses a lot of uh, options for setting like the default name, the default date, the default mm -hmm. license of a package you're trying to create. If you're trying to automate use this with, with like a, introducing use this with with default, you uh, use this recommend using options. But if you are creating a function that other person would use without changing the global environment, you, you can use WIFR for setting it as function arguments, for example. All right, interesting. Okay. And we and we also have the uh, dot onload and dot unattach um, function. I'm not entirely sure on what's the usage of what's the utility of the, the uh, dot onload function, but for the dot unattach, I think it's very um, straightforward, which is so. So whenever we uh, load a library, maybe at um, sometime we have really lengthy startup message and we can include those features in our package by using the dot on attach function and this lib name and package name is a default so you it should always be there by default and it should not be changed and Within this function, we can enclose the package startup message, and you can put you can put um, any message that you want here. So I'm not entirely sure though of this uh, dot onload and dot on unload um, function. So it's not um, as um, mm, yeah. The on, the on attach one would be loaded when you, for example, use library package, right? And the on load will be, even if your function is called inside the other function, like for example, if someone builds a package around your package, it will, it will do something. It's like, mm. that, if you, not sure. For example, you, you can add, a, for, if it's a scientific paper, you can add a message saying inside my, my work in the in the in the in the DOI of the so if you are using the own attach, it will only show if the person load all your package if it if it source like the library package or required package, right? And the own load will will load it will do that on every time that your pack in of your function that your package is loaded. I'm not sure. Hmm. Okay. All right. Well, I think I just have to use them until I understand. <laughs> All right. And when we are um, writing a function and changing the documentation, um, we should always do this a load all document test and check liberally. And it is very recommended to do all this, which may sound a lot, but I think whenever you modify a single function and then do all this and if there's something goes wrong then you know that um, it's due to the changes that you do for that single function or a section um, in your R code and of course 
um, as a consequence, if you found a bug or an, a warning on error when you're checking the package, it will be much easier to pinpoint the cause. And in the um, book, there's also um, a section on how we can include Unicode characters in our R script because basically we have to always use ASC, ASCII characters in our scripts. And if you want to include uh, something else uh, that are uh, present in the uh, Unicode, then we can use the uh, backslash U, U prefix followed by the Unicode. And I think it's very interesting to that um, in the uh, in the book chapter, it is mentioned that if we do a copy paste, then sometimes when we are copy pasting, it uh, there can also be an artifact that is um, included in our R code that is not what we intended to include, and to and that will usually uh, uh, include a non ASCII characters and to and if we found something uh, in our um, chat, then we can always and then we can run this function to uh, to reveal where the non ASCII characters lies in our um, code. Okay. So now we know about the basics of uh, writing the function uh, and then about the, now we're going to discuss about um, how to document the, um, the function using the Eroxygen uh, package. So if you're using the Eroxygen package and then we run the document a function from um, is it that tool for use this? Uh, or the shortcut is, I think, control shift D. Then it will automatically um, look into your um, R file, find any Roxygen um, lines that you have there, and it will automatically create a .rd file in the manual directory. And another very important uh, part is that Roxygen can manage the namespace, uh, automatically generate the namespace file. And this namespace file is what uh, manages what is imported when you're loading your package and also what's exported out of your package into, the, into your uh, memory that will be available for the users of your package. Okay, so um, yes. So uh, creating a Roxygen function is a Roxygen a documentation is, I would say, um, really a straightforward. So here, for example, I have a very simple function. Uh, one moment, I think. Oops. Is it big enough? Uh, for you to see. It's okay for, for me. It's okay. Kevin can can. It's okay. Yeah. Is the colors okay? Or I can change it to the white one. Or is it white? Yeah, the the white with gray is kind. Of, uh, for yeah. me, it's okay. But it, it uh, maybe for if if like on a not so good screen, maybe it will be without contrast. Is it, yeah. is it better or not really? Anyway. Oh, well, yeah, I think it, it has more, more contrast. Yeah. So. All right. It's okay. Yeah. So, okay. Okay. So when we are, um, so I have this function here. And when we, um, um, make this uh, Roxygen documentation, then the first line 
will be considered as the um, like the name of the function, like a very short name, not necessarily this, uh, like uh, the name of this function, for example, add then I, for the first line, I just say adding two numbers. And the first paragraph after this short name of the function will describe the function. And afterwards, the second and the subsequent paragraph are for the description to check. And then here previously I have um, generated the .rd file, and we can also do that using the control shift D shortcut, and it will automatically generate the um, .rd file. And, and then we can look for the help or the documentation of this function by prefixing with a question mark followed by the name of the function. Oops. And then, voila, here it is. So, um, so here is the documentation of the function. So you can see this is a function add from this, well, I just named my package within. And here is the first paragraph that so is for the description. And if you want to go into details of what's actually happening within this function, then you can span, you can use this second and this subsequent paragraph to do that. And then we can use the add param to explain um, the input, the arguments for the function. For example, here, just a number and I'll just say another number. Okay. And if you want to change this, if you want to see um, whether the changes will be reflected in the .rd file, then we can always just build the documentation again using the control shift D. And if we find it again, right. And now um, the change is refresh. And I think what I find quite uh, I think what I think will be useful is this uh, backslash don't run uh, function. Uh, I, don't, uh, I don't know, it's not really a function, but if you enclose a function with this um, backslash don't run and curly brackets, then it will not run this function. And I find this, it will really useful to give an example of uh, what kind of function, what kind of inputs will give an error. So here we see in the examples, oh, it's not really big, I suppose, uh, that in the third line, there is this uh, not run at, then I just um, give a short description that if you do this, then it will give an error. So why do we have to do this? Because if we are not enclosing this without this uh, don't run and curly brackets, then it will actually cause an error when you're uh, checking the, um, when you're doing the check. So if you want to give an example of how things can go wrong, always remember to use this um, backslash uh, don't run. Okay. And another thing that I find also interesting is that if we have a family of functions that have quite an overlap in their input or their arguments, I find the inherit patterns is as very useful. So here, for example, in this add function, I have um, X and Y arguments. So this is a number, Y is for another number, but what if I want to add three, um, numbers for uh, using my function, then I have Z. So this will be the third number. And if I use the inherit patterns and see the documentation. So as you can see here, I only define Z, but then in the documentation, I also have X and Y. 
because it copies from the x and y that I have described here. And I find this very useful because if you make a change here, so let's say um, another number will change the second number, then this change will also be reflected. So we are changing the documentation for the end, and this change will be reflected in the other function that inheriting this um, documentation. And let's see how it turns out. So we are building the documentation. Then let's just do a quick check. We'll take a while. Okay, everything succeeds. All right, and here, as you can see, the changes in the add um, documentation is also reflected here. All right. Mm -hmm. mm, yep. Yeah. Well, this is uh, what I showed you before. All right. And in addition to this, oh yeah, I think it's also very important to note that we should always add this at export in our oxygen tax because else if, if we don't do this, then we will not see uh, this function in the namespace. So, and let's see. So here I have the add three exported and let's see what would happen if we don't include this. So I'm just mm, doing documentation and then checking again. Checking, checking and checking. Hmm. Yes, because it could not find the function at three. Hmm. Of course, it cannot find the. Ah, yeah, because I'm running the examples here, and because I didn't export this, it will just try to run the examples, but it cannot find the function. Well. I didn't mean to show this part, but yeah, now I know. So because it's a good, yeah, it's a good try to run the function. <laughs> yeah. So just because I think by default it is not um, it is not uh, generated when you're uh, creating the skeleton, I think, or is it? Um, let's say blah. Function x x. Let's say if you want. Oh yeah, by default it is generated. Okay, good. Oh. So I think the only case where you don't want to uh, include this is maybe you have like some internal functions where you do a checking or maybe a preprocessing that you don't really want. Um, your, the use of your package to use. So you can um, remove this line so that the users of your package will not be able to access it. All right, and there are also um, other tags for the oxygen. There are the see also family aliases and keywords. I think this would be uh, very useful if you have um, family of functions that belong to the same category. Yeah, actually the alias is it's, it's really important for when you're using the help 
where you can add like uh, terms that, that will find your function when you type in the help oh. panel. So is it like if we use um, different spelling for color, like American or- uh, yeah, you, yeah, for example, you can add diff different aliases for, mm -hmm. for when the person is trying to find some help about your function. All right. Okay. And we can also uh, make a Roxygen uh, documentation for your package and well um, the authors recommend to uh, so you're documenting a null and label them with this so uh, use the doc type tag and then the and then use package and name followed by the package name and we also put this in the R folder also in the form of an, a dot r file and usually just name this with the name of your package okay so for the documentation of the classes i honestly doesn't have that good of an idea but what i can uh, tell is that there are um, various um, things that you have to keep in mind when you're uh, documenting um, various classes of uh, for your R code. I really think I should have uh, read at once R for this, but I'm doing the R packages instead. But anyway, um, when you when we are um, writing a uh, when we're writing the documentation, there are also special characters we have to keep in mind. So if you want to put the ad, note that this ad is reserved for the um, Roxygen tag. But if we want to add this anyway, we use um, double ad. But then for the other, like percentage and backs and slash, uh, backslash, then we just use a backslash to escape. Uh, this following character, just like uh, any other characters that we want to escape. Okay, so I think, yeah, this inherit params I somehow have um, also discussed before. So this is just for um, if we have two functions with overlapping input arguments, but we want to keep the, doc the documentation of the input in one place, then using the inherit params is the way to go. And what if we don't have an, like really an overlap, but we want to include all the functions in one documentation anyway? So we can use this uh, this type in. I think I have an example. Oh no, no, I don't. I think. Oh yeah, this this type in. So uh, to document multiple functions in the same file, we have two methods. The first one is this this type in. So this is useful if we have um, if you're here, for example, we are using an S3 method to, for a function called uh, foobar that will change the behavior um, depending on the input, on the type of the input that you have. For example, if you want to, uh, if, we, if the input is numeric, then it will do this, then it, or if the input is character, then it will do the second, um, the second function instead. And these are basically the, maybe basically the same thing, but just um, the method dispatch according to the um, type of the input. And we can use the at describing and then foobar, it's the name of the function, to uh, put them in one documentation. 
And the second way is using the RD name tag. So here, for example, I have one um, documentation for a basic arithmetic um, operations, but I'm excluding addition because I have defined the add function separate in a separate uh, document. So first, we just have to let's say here. First, we are actually documenting the null, and then afterwards we have all of our uh, functions. So in the, so for example, I have times to multiply, div to divide, and pow to, uh, to power the first number to the power of the second number. And if we do this, then all this times div and pow function will be included in the documentation for this edit. And if we look at the documentation, then here, here it is. So we have, because the arguments are all the same, all X and Y are both numeric factors. And here I have all the functions, uh, times, uh, divide and power and everything in one documentation. But what I find very interesting is that note that I look for this documentation using this edit, but if I use the name of the function, like times or div, that I, then I could not find them. Maybe we can use the al allies for this? I think it will, it, yeah, it, it's, 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 it would be the case to use the aliases. Yeah. But just keep in mind that if you're uh, trying to include all the uh, um, many functions in one documentation using this method, you can only find them using the name um, of the, uh, using the primary name, but not the, um, the RT, not the, fun the name of the other functions. All right. Yeah, one one other thing that that's that's useful to use the RD name, because actually you can have your R code in different files, but the documentation in the same file also. You can have like three different files with different. If if you want to to get your code on, on different files, you can still have the the documentation in the same file. Hmm. What do you mean documentation in different files? No, uh, for example, uh, you, you could have a dot .r file for each of those functions. For example, if they are big functions and you don't want to have all of them in the same dot .r file and you use mm -hmm. the rd tag, uh, the, it will still have the documentation in the same page, in the same help page, but in your code would be separated. Ah, uh, yeah. It's, it's, right. just, it's just code organization, okay. yeah, code, code style. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, so it doesn't have to be in one .r file, you mean, right? So yeah, we can exactly. put it in, in separate one, but as long as we have the rd name, then we can always link the function into this one main. Name. Yeah, or you can inherit parameters, you can use the rd name, even if the function isn't, isn't in, the, in the same .r file. And actually, yeah, yeah, that, that's it. <laughs> Okay. So you can do examples too on a separate file. Oh yeah, yeah. It's it's probably also a good usage. Having if you, especially if you have a lot of examples that would clutter your main mm. the file where, when where you're coding, you can have a separate file for the examples, or you yeah. can like for example have examples for the entire package. Mm. I have a bad habit. I've been deleting my examples out because, and I don't yeah. know why. Because like, because sometimes it's like multiple lines, and so when I once I saw that, I was like, well, I might come back to that and do it that way. For some reason, I don't like it on the up in the function. Just personal taste. I don't know what it is. Yeah, but some, it's, 
I think, I think it's a good style to have it separated. <laughs> and and easy, it, it easy, the, this step of development when you are changing a lot of the, if you change the code, you have to change the examples. It's easy to manage mm. to have it separated. Hmm. All right, that's true. All right. And, oh, we still have time. All right, and the third section is on managing the namespace. So I think this is the um, biggest and most frequent source of headache because I use these two packages quite frequently together. So, um, so what a namespace is, I, you could you can think of it as a space where the name belongs. So it's really straightforward. And what name is the name of your function? A function that is contained with a package. And if we have um, a, pack, uh, a name of a function that can actually be traced into multiple packages, then depending on the order, for in this case, for example, depending on the order in which you load these two packages, then it will call, I think the, the later function, the later uh, function that is uh, loaded, because whenever you load a package using uh, maybe the library function, then it will um, load the package, load the functions into the namespace. And then if you are loading another package, it will load the functions again and it will overwrite, um, not really overwrite, but it, the priority of the function that is used, if you don't um, use these two columns, will be um, for the package that is um, loaded later. So it is very, very important when we're writing a package to ensure that the uh, the functions in our package is self-contained, and we can um, do that do it by do this by smartly importing and exporting the functions. Okay, so I think loading and attaching. I I'm I'm not entirely sure of the difference, but please uh, tell me whether I um, got this right or wrong. So, uh, so attaching is what we usually do when we are doing interactive uh, data analysis. When we're um, load loading or or maybe now uh, attaching a package using the library or the required function, and as a result, the functions will be available in your um, in the namespace. And what that means is that if uh, you load a uh, the dplyr package, for example, oh, dplyr, then if you, if we, and then if we do select, which is supposed to be from the dplyr package, then it will automatically search the namespace of the of whatever functions that is loaded um, or attached into the environment, and it will find okay the select came from the dplyr package. Whereas if we load, then the package the functions can is actually there. It is loaded into memory, so it can be used by whatever functions in your package that depends on that function. But however, it is not readily available for your users so in, uh, for interactive use, but it's there. But it's just not that, it's just we cannot um, do that. Uh, we cannot access it easily. So why do we want to do that? It's simply because if we we want to keep the environment or the global environment as clean as possible. So the idea is to really minimize the changes 
in the global environment. And, and if you want to see, so what are the functions or packages that is loaded, uh, loaded or attached? I think it's a very loaded term now. I'm a bit confused to say what. So, um, so this new space file, which you can find in the root folder of your um, R package, will manage what are the functions that are exported when you are um, loading, um, when you are attaching the package. Oof, very confusing. So this yeah, document is- What is important to address here is, is that before the development of the DevTools package, this was something that you had to do manually instead of getting this export tag on your function on, on your app.r file, you had to go All right. to have to create that file manually and add each line for each function that you needed to, to export. That, that's why this file exists. The R expects that this file exists, but the, 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 the development team of the DevTools package created a, a way so you can document the function in a way that it's auto-completed. Okay. So I guess that is why the um, writing R extension, uh, uh, I think there is the PDF from the CRAN, right? The writing R Yeah, yeah, the, the R And that is very, very long. Yes. <laughs> like, there, I don't there even... is a, a really specific way of how you add the code to your namespace file. Like uh, you, you had to, uh, to add the import from everything. Yeah. Oh. Well, I guess if you have to do all these things manually, then you would need a really big manual for this. Oh, thankfully I'm new to R, so I don't have to go through that pain in using R. I think I will grow to hit R if I if I if I grew up in that era. But anyway, so um, for a loading and attaching your uh, library, there are actually um four ways to do this and it which um, you can stratify according to whether it loads or attach and also whether it will throw an error so it will stop uh, maybe it will stop your uh, data analysis script or stop the loading of your library or it will simply return a logical so whether uh, the function can find the package or not so whether it whether your package is installed or not. But in practice, the authors recommended to only use two. So whenever we are doing a, uh, an interactive analysis, just use library. I think a lot of people use require, but I get that um, if we do library, then um, if, if apparently we don't have the package installed, then it will immediately throw an error and warns us that, hey, you don't have this package to install. And if you're using it, using this and the equivalent for this library, if but for um, writing a package is require a namespace. Well, not really equivalent because, um, yeah, I think now this is, I'm not entirely sure so here, the authors recommended to use this, but I, from many experiences of installing our packages, I think a lot of people are using this instead because sometimes when I'm installing a package, then it's just, I really have to think hard on how to install the dependencies and so on. And I just simply cannot um, load this one package until I got all the dependencies uh, installed. But yeah, actually the, the required namespace will not attach the, the will not lo load the functions. Mm. It will just check if the functions yeah. are loaded. So so it's a way to, to address if the package is available or not for usage, but it will not make the, the functions available for the, 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 the package. It, and, and the load namespace yeah. will will load the function so the you have the functions available inside your package. Yeah. 
But uh, usually people have, uh, it's, it's usually a good practice to avoid the load namespace because it will throw errors. So if, if you're not handling correctly the, 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 the errors, you, it will mess your package. So it's usually better to use the required namespace and treat it according, like it will return a, a true or false and you can, in your package logic, define if, it, if you're going to stop, mm. if you're going to continue without the package being loaded. All right. So yeah, so in the package, we should just use this and we handle the error in our own way then. Okay. So um, yes, when we're writing um, a package and if we want to include a function from a package or maybe the entire package, we should never use this require our library to load uh, the functions because of course it will contaminate the global environment. So we, what we should do is use uh, depends or imports in the description field instead. So, uh, yeah, so for the export, um, yeah, so by default, if we are creating the um, Roxygen skeleton using the shortcut in our studio, the export tag will always be included. And in return, automatically this, the function with the export tag will be included in the namespace. And I think yeah, this is um, quite an important one. If we want to import, so there are, um, uh, several ways to do this. And I think the authors recommended to always list the uh, package in the import field in the, uh, disc in the description file. And afterwards, even though we have, um, if we have, uh, if even though we have put the package in that description file or in the import field of the description file, we should always at a package, um, determine where the function comes from. So I think this is a good practice. And but then if we uh, use a certain function all the time, maybe in in your uh, package, you're using um, the plier uh, family of functions to wrangle your data. Then you can use import from package name and then what function uh, that you want to import. And for me. Um, I think I'd really like to import uh, the, make the pipe from the Mac reader. And we can also import the whole functions in a package. But of course, this is very not recommended because it greatly increases the risk of conflicting function names. All right, so that's it. Okay. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, I'm great. It was, it was a really good presentation. Yeah, that there is a lot of important topics on these chapters, especially on, now on the on the end, the, that part about S3 and S4 classes that they use. It's it's good, I think, to comment that it, it, it uses a, a lot of different ways of documenting, but especially if I think it's most important for people that that's coming from another language that that are mostly object-oriented, like Java or something. Sometimes they prefer to use S3 methods and things like that. But for example, for the bioconductor team, they actually recommend you to use S4 methods yeah. instead of, of or, or extending the, because actually they provide a lot of S4 methods and they recommend you to extend their own mix format. So it's kind of important, but it's, it's I personally prefer the functional way to to describe the function. It's it's most it's uh, a lot clearer and easier to use. Yeah, <laughs> and I also uh, well, I first my first programming language that I learned seriously is R, but then when I try to use this um, S three or S four, I really cannot wrap my head around it because first you have to define the generic function and then all the constructors, it's so confusing. 
but yeah. when you act but when you write a uh, a class in python for example it becomes so clear it's so it's, it's so different compared to r i would say because everything uh everything is included within the uh the definition, the, the definition. <laughs> yeah, i find that nice but yeah i think the yeah, it's actually a mess on R because they have different ways or different implementations of, of the object orientation. I think the most close to the Python object orientation will be the R6 yeah. methods. Yeah, and I think it, it, that, that will be closer for someone that comes from Python. And um, uh, yeah, I, I, it's really important to understand the S3 methods when you are trying to extend the base R functions. For example, if you want to create a custom print method for, um, for a function, you, you need to extend the uh, S3, yeah. S3 generics. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I think the S3 um, classes, I would say it's Class. very great for interactive data analysis. Because I think if we use, if we do linear regression in using stats models in okay. Python, for example, first you just load. You're actually just inputting the data and the arguments, but then it didn't do anything. So you have to do the fit, and then it will finally run. Whereas if you do a linear regression in R, well, you define the formula, the data, and then it will automatic. It will instantly run the fu function. So I find yeah, yeah. for data analysis, I find R is, I would say more intuitive, maybe because this is the first language that I learned for the sake of data analysis. <laughs> but if I- Yeah, but, but I, 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 I really agree with that. It's much more straightforward because mostly it was developed thinking on the analyst point of view. So yeah. I think it's really objective. Um, yeah. <laughs> Great job. That brought it a better light to it. I had a hard time with those some of those uh, subjects, but going through it made it much more clear. So thank you. Oh yeah, you're welcome. It's a lot, but no. <laughs> yeah, especially the the depth to the uh, our oxygen tags. You have to experiment with it to get used. There are, yeah. there are some of them that looks redundant, but when you try them, for example, that there is the RD name, there is the family, they have some different uses, but, but you, using that, you, 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 <laughs> you get used to. But especially, it's good to acknowledge that there is a lot of intrinsicalities of the, the way uh, a package need to be created, but the DevTools package and then ROX and try to get it, everything inside your um, .r file. So you, you don't have to think a lot about the, the specific uh, files, the structure. If you, if you wrap your, your head around the, the DevTools way of developing a package, you will have everything inside your your R folder, your R folder in your .r files, and it will create the, the, the structure. So it's, it's actually really easy nowadays to develop an R package for at least a minimal working working R package. It, it, it's it's really an improvement from a decade ago. <laughs> a decade ago. So how long have you been using R? No, no, not myself, but, but I, 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 exactly the, the DevTools package was developed in 2011, I think, the first version. Uh, that is true. I started using yeah. one in 2012, and it was just brutal because yeah. I had no data yeah. imagine. background. <laughs> I was coming just trying to find an alternative to Excel. <laughs> and cool. I was like, like, I don't know what the heck's going on. It's improved vastly in the documentation. Yeah, the and I love the, it. The, the, the tight verse, it's uh, something wonderful if you look for <laughs> this, this, this decade ago. <laughs> oh my gosh, it has. Yeah, I mean, I, f I find the discussion between a base and tight verse is very useless. <laughs> yeah. Because, well, I mean, I also use the dollar sign. Um, I wouldn't use um, 
like a select and then pull to just uh, get if you if you want to get something from a data frame. So I think there are a lot of um, a lot of things that can be learned from both. But I do you know this thing? Yeah. Sometimes I pull some base, some base when I just can't get it with the tidyverse. I've had to do some, and I learned. Um, I took that Coursera course. Uh, our programming from John Hopkins and they yeah that course was based on a lot of uh, uh, base R so to get yeah. to the course I did a little I'll did a little mix of dplyr and base okay oh but so did, so you did I that after, after learning the tidyverse <laughs> <laughs> yeah actually yeah, yeah, yeah. that I that I, I got the, like the, the, the for um, I mostly learned it during 2017 but actually uh, I, I was in a laboratory that that, that the other person used just Bazaar. So I, I first learned Bazaar and, yeah, and I also did that course, the Johns Hopkins course. So I, I mostly learned the Bazaar and then after that I learned the, the Tidevest and it was amazing. I said, oh my God, I, I would just use the Tidevest because it's so much easier. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Someone was starting out, I'd definitely point them to the do tidyverse stuff, uh, but sometimes yeah, if, if man, once you do helps. data analysis, you, you need just to focus on the tidyverse. It's much easier. Yeah. And yeah. It, it, actually, it's it's not that it's easier, but it's easier to get output. You you don't have to learn the um, computing stuff. You just have to know your data, and you can output um, insight from your data much easier. Yeah, and what I really like about Tidyverse is that it tries to um, translate all this pro programming or data science lingo into English. Yeah. I think yeah. I find a group by and summarize is very easy to understand compared to, compared to if you do split and then L apply, which... <laughs> You're right. It, it's like a whole, uh, it's whole ocean of difference. It's yeah, so most of those like group by summarized stuff come, comes from the SQL, SQL, SQL yeah. the, the mm -hmm. database language. And I, actually, I was trying to learn SQL, and I, 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 it's not that easy to learn SQL. But when I saw it in the in the in the Tideverse, it, it made more sense in the Tideverse with the pipe. You, you have step by step things. Then actually learning SQL. <laughs> Yeah, you're right. Okay. No, oh, I, I think so. one one thing that we need to address before stop is the um, in the in the first cohort they they had an extra session after this. Yeah, I think this. what we are what they are working on, right? Yeah, um, in uh, before the the testing and the, the next chapters, what you guys think about we having like next week. Uh, to, to talk about packages we are developing or ideas or maybe having some interactive programming stuff or you prefer to just go on the book to follow mm. the, the book <laughs> well i don't mind um adapting the schedule but i'm not entirely sure um what to talk about though Okay. Yeah, uh, uh, it would be mostly useful if we already had something uh, uh, personal package that that you need help or something. But if if mm -hmm. you, it's not the case, we, we can just follow the the book order. The I'm actually thinking of um, documenting my data analysis project into a package, but then I'm not. Yeah, I think. Yeah, or, or if you about it, that, it not be, be be ready for next week, we can uh, go and yeah. have, like, for example, have, have have a session in the mm -hmm. end of the, the book, maybe. I think I can <laughs> uh, quickly uh, make something out of it. Yeah, because um, my main, um, I think my main uh, problem about documenting my data analysis project into a package is that I'm not entirely sure where to put my data because sometimes my data is very big. 
mm. that you cannot just include it as is in the uh, package. But then do you okay. store it in Zenodo? Do you store it in which yeah. repository where you can store? Because actually we have to store your data for a package. <laughs> yeah. And especially um, maybe my date, my uh, project has not been published yet. So of course okay, I can yeah, so uh, put it in the local okay. repository. So, yeah. but it's not that I have looked into where uh, to store them and I cannot find them at all, but I think, yeah. I think a big start to that to would be to create a synthetic data, for example, an example data you don't have, you don't need to have all your data to, That's to get your package working. That's true. Especially if you want to publish your, your package, it's it's good to have a minimal that data set that maybe could, could be mm -hmm. junk inside your package. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah, just something that I can uh, work because I may not have, I may not, not always have an idea for a package to uh, write, but then I would always have a project to analyze. So. Yeah, yeah. It's um, I think the if if you think your the way you analyze a package, uh, you analyze your data, it would be useful for other person. It will it will already be a, a a good package to develop. Like for example, if your research group would need to use it for another kind of data, or another student would need to use. Oh, if you just show it to the world, <laughs> it's, it's a good, it's a good method to to get things going. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. After after you you say that uh, that you haven't really write a package, it's also the same case with me. Yeah, and I think it would be very such a waste if I if we do this book club and then I don't have any uh, practical project. Yeah, actually, I have a lot of small things that I already separated in, like package skeleton or base things that I, I try to start, but I need to focus in one to, to yeah. get it going. I'm doing the shiny contest. I'm working. I started digging into oh. the data set, but it's not that interesting. It's not. There's not much. There's not. It's not even going to be that great of a shiny app. I just may have a display because it's not going to be that interactive. There's. I was a little bit disappointed. I'll probably just put some maps and. Yeah. put something together in a package and submit it as a for the shiny contest not expecting too much out of it oh just great oh yeah i think it, oh, one thing about the r community it's that the people is really welcome and yeah I, I i personally agree that you you need to try and you need to get things inside package and show it to the world like go get it in github try to submit in the like yeah. like we said for the for the contest yes. in the um, studio community because actually people give a, a lot of good feedback when yeah. you, for, um, you, yeah. pro, you maybe you have something in your head that you are not getting it perfectly but when you show it to the world you 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 actually had yeah. you had, you get good advice on yeah. it and it's then, so and different you, from stack overflow yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> exactly that's crazy yes it's a really welcoming community and uh, it's, it's good to get there. And actually, um, when you show what you're doing to other people, uh, the, the other people also get a lot of good insights. So it's useful. <laughs> That's true. For example, yeah. I, I was trying also to include some, some shine. I, I was trying to include some shine inside a package skeleton using the the modules, the shiny modules to, to separate the, the interface in different functions. But uh, I, I just started with that, but uh, I, I would probably get some advice about doing that. <laughs> sure. All right, so then what do you think, Kevin? Should we do that uh, for next week? So just to discuss our, uh, what we want to do or maybe what we are uh, doing in relation with this R packages book club. I don't have a or, or maybe I think one week maybe too short, maybe the week after yeah. after we do the test. Because actually I, I was supposed to present next week, so I I had to prepare myself for 
for the next topic. And uh, yeah, I think yeah, maybe for others who would join, um, putting two weeks would be good, right? Okay. Oh, seems like you're muted, but you don't have the no. mute symbol. No. Yeah, because you're not muted, but we don't, we cannot hear you. I'm still cannot hear you. Still not. Now, <laughs> now you are muted. Now, you, yeah, now you're muted, but yeah. <laughs> okay then. Uh, so I guess we'll just uh, stick um, to the schedule for next week. And then in two weeks, we will just, uh, maybe we, we don't even have to create a presentation, just a share what you want to do. And yeah, so <laughs> yeah, so yeah, try to make it as fictionless as possible for all of us. All right. Thanks for all discussion. So see you next week. Bye-bye.